Welcome to Lecture 1, General Principles. Before we jump into our study of statics, we're going to look at where statics fits in the world of engineering, uh, the fundamental concepts and principles uh, upon which statics uh, is based, the two systems of units that we're going to use uh, in working our statics problems, how to convert within each system of units and between the two systems of units. We'll also discuss some basic rules uh, that we're going to follow concerning our numerical calculations. And we'll look at a general approach for solving statics problems. Statics is one of the major components of the physical science known as mechanics. Mechanics deals with the conditions of rest or motion of bodies that are under the action of forces or loads. It is composed of three branches. Statics and dynamics fall under the branch of rigid body mechanics, where statics focuses on bodies at rest or in equilibrium, and dynamics focuses on bodies that are undergoing accelerated motion. The second branch of mechanics is deformable body mechanics, and the third branch is fluid mechanics, where gases and liquids are considered. Mechanics is considered to be the foundation of most engineering sciences. The four basic quantities used throughout mechanics are length, time, mass, and force. Length, time, and mass should be already familiar to you, so let's look at force. A force represents the action of one body on another. It may be caused by actual contact between the two bodies or without contact between the two bodies. Examples of forces that occur without contact are gravitational forces, magnetic forces, and electrical forces. A force is a vector quantity that is completely defined by its point of application its magnitude and its direction. Here are three important idealizations that we'll make extensive use of in our study of statics and you'll continue to use throughout your study of mechanics. In many problems we can ignore the size of a body and model it as a particle. This can greatly simplify a problem in that we're not concerned with the geometry of the body. We mentioned a rigid body earlier uh, a rigid body is one that does not deform when we apply a force or load to it. And more formally, we say that it's composed of a lot, large number of particles occupying fixed positions with respect to one another. And those positions do not change as the body is loaded with a force and then unloaded by removing the force. The third one is a, the concept of a concentrated force. When we apply a force to a body, we're going to assume that it acts at a single point on the body. Newton's first law is very important in statics. The body to which forces are being applied will always be in equilibrium. This means that the body is not undergoing acceleration, which means that its velocity is constant. Most, if not all, of the problems that we work in this course will involve a constant velocity equal to zero, which means that the body is at rest. But note that a body that has non-zero constant velocity that has forces being applied to it is still a statics problem. We've established in statics that there is no accelerated motion. So Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, when acceleration is equal to zero, reduces to Newton's first law. Newton's third law will come into play when we learn how to draw free body diagrams. Using Newton's law of gravitational attraction, 
we can show that the weight of a body or an object is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity at the location of the object. Now note that the acceleration due to gravity changes depending on where you are on the earth and what your elevation is. But for our purposes in SI, we're going to use a value of 9.81 meters per second squared for G. And in FPS, foot pound second, we're going to use a value of 32.2 feet per second squared for G. Also note that this little g is not the same as this big g. Two different things. So to summarize with respect to the four fundamental principles that were just discussed, the uh, Newton's first law and Newton's third law are very important to statics. Um, in addition, the parallelogram law for the addition of forces and the principle of transmissibility are also very important, and we will discuss those in future lectures. Engineers in the U.S. have to be fluent in two different systems of units. I'll talk first about the international system of units, SI, commonly called metric. I talked earlier about the four basic quantities that we use in mechanics, mass, length, time, and force. In SI, mass, length, and time are known as base units. They're given to us, and we know them as the kilogram, the meter, and the second. And force is what's known as a derived unit. And we know force in SI as the Newton. We derive force in SI from F equals MA. So we write this equation here where kilograms is mass, meters per second squared is acceleration. Those are our defined units. So to create equality across the equal sign, force is then equal to kilograms times meters over second squared. Now we, that's a clunky thing to say and write. So that has been named the Newton. To make it easier on us. And what we're saying is, is that one Newton of force applied to one kilogram of mass will accelerate that mass at one meter per second squared in accordance with Newton's second law. Now, again, we're not going to use Newton's second law really at all in statics, but you will see it. You will see plenty of it in dynamics. Let's look at the relationship between weight and mass in SI. We'll do so by considering an object that has a mass of one kilogram that is in free fall or accelerating towards the center of the earth. And we're going to apply Newton's second law to the object. The only force acting on the object is the force of gravity or the object's weight. So we'll put that on the left side of our equation. The mass of the object, we know that. We'll call it small m for now. 
and the acceleration of the object is the acceleration due to gravity or g now this equation w equals mg should look familiar we arrived at this several slides ago when we were discussing the uh, newton's law of gravitation so we have an equation with just one unknown so we'll fill in the mass of one kilogram the acceleration due to gravity which we've stated we're going to assume for this course is 9.81 meters per second squared we do the math here and combine the units we have end up with 9.81 kilogram meters per second squared and remember this is what we said that we're we call the Newton so the weight of the one kilogram object is 9.81 newtons so on earth one kilogram weighs 9.81 newtons note that when the acceleration due to gravity changes for different situations planets moons that the weight of that one kilogram mass is also going to change also note here that if we start with the if we know the weight of the object but not the mass we can find the mass by this equation mass equals weight over the acceleration due to gravity let's look at the second system of units that we need to know how to work in we call this the u.s customary system or fps for foot pound second the base units in fps are length force and time foot pound and second the derived unit is mass and the unit of mass is known as the slug there's no abbreviation for slug. We derive the unit of mass from Newton's second law, F equals MA, just like we did in the SI case. But in the FPS case, mass is the unit we are deriving, not force. So in FPS, we have a unit for force, which is the pound. We use foot and second squared to express acceleration, which means that the mass unit will have to have the units of pound second squared per foot in order to maintain equivalency across the equal sign. So we end up with pounds equals pounds. And again, for convenience, we call this unit of mass the slug. So a slug is the amount of mass that will accelerate at one foot per second squared when a force of one pound is applied to it. Let's look at the relationship between weight and mass now in FPS. We'll set this up the same way we did uh, for the SI case. We'll have an object with a mass of one slug that's in free fall it's accelerating towards the center of the earth we'll apply newton's second law to the situation the only force acting on the object is the force of gravity or the weight of the object we know the mass of the object and we know that the acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity g but we need to remember that 
we need the value of G now in FPS. So we'll plug in the things that we know. We know that we have a mass of one slug and the acceleration due to gravity in FPS is 32.2 feet per second squared. So we do that multiplication, rearrange the units, and we have 32.2 slug times feet divided by seconds squared, which, as we just discussed on the previous slide, is going to be pounds. So on Earth, one slug weighs 32 pounds, and just like an SI, if the mass is unknown, but we know the weight, we can get the mass by mass equals weight over acceleration due to gravity. So here's the two systems of units we just discussed. Note that in SI, force is the derived unit. And in FPS, mass is the derived unit. As engineers in the US, you'll need to get comfortable working in both SI and FPS and converting between them when necessary. In this course, you will work your homework problems in the units given unless instructed otherwise. Some of the problems are given in SI, some of the problems are given in SPS. As you write equations throughout the course, you need to remain aware that these equations contain dimensions as well as numbers. Any equation you write needs to be dimensionally homogeneous. Said another way, that means that the dimensions on both sides of the equal sign have to be the same. We'll just look at a quick example here. Suppose we were going to use the formula distance equals speed times time. When I'm writing that equation, I need to make sure that if I intend for to be working in meters and seconds, that any number I put in for distance is in the units of meters. Any number that I put in for speed is in the units of meters per second. And any number that I put in for time is in the units of seconds. If I adhere to that, then I've maintained the dimensional homogeneity of the equation because as you can see the units on both sides of the equation are equal. Two important things regarding the numbers in our equations and our answers are significant figures and rounding. As a rule of thumb our answers can't have any more significant figures than the loads in geometry given in a problem. Remember as you're working through your solution not to round until you get to the final answer. Store those intermediate results in your calculator if you're working through you know a long involved problem. We will generally round answers in this course to three significant figures. I'll give you some examples here of rounding to three significant figures. So this first one here, 10,576.37 rounded to three significant figures is 10,600, where these numbers are significant and these two zeros are considered placeholders, not significant. 0 0.0009348 would round to 
0.00935 where these are significant and the zeros after the decimal point are considered placeholders. Now, what about the case where our, we're rounding a number that ends in a five? So there's two ways to do this. One way is to simply always round that up to the next number. In other words, 10.05 would round to 10.1. Another school of thought is since five is the midpoint of one through nine, the numbers that you'd be rounding, that if the number preceding the five is even, that you don't round up. And if the number preceding the five is odd, that you do round up. So it splits that rounding in a 50-50 fashion. So I'm gonna show you the second uh, school of thought where 10.05 would round down to 10.0 since the number in front of the five is even. Um, you can use either way in the course. Uh, I would just prefer that you remain consistent uh, with one way or the other. The widely held opinion is that the most effective way to learn the principles of engineering mechanics is to solve problems. This is a problem solving course. You are going to be working lots of problems. I've listed some general steps for solving a problem here that I'll let you read. Please note that there are specific homework guidelines listed in the syllabus that you are required to follow and that I expect all of your work to be clear, concise, neat, and complete.